Hello everyone, welcome to the video. Today I'm going to be doing a book review on the book that I just finished reading called The Philosopher's Pupil by Iris Murdoch. Now recently I went to the local library um, which has only just opened up again and as I was walking around just having a look at what books were there I came across one that was on display and it was this one. The Philosopher's Pupil, and I'd never seen it before, it's obviously labelled vintage, it's a classic according to the, the advertising in the library, and I'd uh, never heard of it, I thought I'd give it a go. Um, I didn't recognise the name, didn't recognise anything about the book, I had a look at the blurb and I thought, well, I have some time on my hands, I might as well give it a go. And I borrowed this, knowing that, yeah, I probably wasn't going to get this finished in like a week, it would take me at least a couple, um, because <laughs> I'm not really that fast of a reader, and I have quite a a bit of stuff going on as well on the outside but um it was not too bad some books like this that are really long you'll find they're quite tedious and the pacing is really off but um with this book it kind of worked because it sort of made it seem like it was happening in real time but uh despite the length you know if you're um i'd say it's probably if you're a teenager or up then uh, you'll probably enjoy this book, um, even if you don't particularly like long books, because you can kind of read it in increments. But um, in this book review, uh, I'm going to be doing uh, a bit of a, my thoughts on the book um, and what generally people might think about it, because I noticed that there are a couple of reviews on the internet, but not that many. Uh, it's not really that well known of a book in general, I think. Um, and so I'm just going to go over it today. Now, I don't usually uh, read book reviews until after I finish reading the book. It's kind of a rule of mine. And I did the same rule with this book. And I'm kind of glad that I did because I might have been put off by the reviews. Um, whilst people uh, who read it at the time it was written received it quite well. Nowadays, uh, they're kind of more three star, four star reviews um, rather than something that you'd expect from like a classic. Um, but yeah, so people received it quite well uh, back in 1983 when this book was written. Um, and that's unsurprising as it does have quite a lot of family drama that may be associated with that time period uh, or generally the kind of phrasing may be associated with that time as well. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about actually is a bit about Iris Murdoch because um, a lot of the stuff she's written kind of interlinks with this book and it gives you an insight as to the kind of audience may want to read this book as well. So if you're deciding whether or not you might want to read it or um, deciding whether or not you're going to need to, then uh, I'll just give you an idea now. Basically, um, Iris Murdoch is kind of a part-time philosopher in the sense she's written a, a number of non-fiction books about philosophy as well, uh, and her um, other fictional books contain a lot of philosophical thinking. Um, this one is not excluded from that. And well, firstly, it's called The Philosopher's Pupil, so that should give you a bit of a hint. But um, in it, uh, Rosanov, the name of the philosopher uh, mentioned in the title, uh, goes on quite a lot of tirades about philosophy. And even the author himself, uh, the, the narrator, sorry, um, called N, also uh, has quite a good understanding of of philosophy. That's not to say that you need to have a good uh, philosophical understanding of nature in itself to read this book. Actually, it's written in a way that um, people who have not studied it at all, like me, will be able to understand. So that's really useful. Now I'm going to talk about the blurb and give a kind of general overview of the book as a whole before I go into the plot, which will contain spoilers. So I'll put like a timestamp in the description uh, when we get to it so that you can skip ahead if you don't want the book spoiled for you if you're planning on reading it yourself. Anyway, so let's start with the blurb. Um, it reads, in the English town of Enninstone, hot springs bubble up from beneath the earth. In these healing waters, the townspeople seek help and regeneration, righteousness and ritual cleaning. To this town, steeped in ancient lore and subterranean inspiration, the philosopher returns. He exerts an almost magical influence over a host of Enninstonians, and especially over George McCaffrey, the philosopher's old pupil, a demonic man desperate for redemption. Now, this blurb, that's obviously what I read and then decided to borrow the book from the library, but it doesn't give a good overview of the story at all, in my opinion, partially because the story is so huge and this blurb only mentions two of the many, many characters that this book goes into detail on. Uh, most of this book is written from switching perspectives of uh, a host of different characters, so you get to know each one really well on an individual level, whereas this, yeah, this... Um, blurb only mentions two of those. Um, not to mention the fact that uh, 
it ignores the fact um, of large plot points based around kind of family drama or local drama <laughs> um, and kind of gives a an idea of a more magical and mystical kind of tale rather than what it is which is a slightly comedic and um, philosoph philosophical sort of discussion about a uh, kind of English life in the 80s and, and, and philosophy itself even. So my really brief overview is that uh, the McCaffrey family is the main central uh, set of characters for the overall story. You have George McCaffrey, who's the uh, demonic man mentioned in the blurb. Uh, he's the old philosopher's pupil and he's considered by everyone to be a massive dickhead, basically. You have Stella McCaffrey, who is the wife of George, who, like many other girls in Enninstone, just want to save George McCaffrey. They believe they can uh, save him from his demonic ways or or from his terrible sadness that haunts him. You then have Brian and uh, Gabrielle McCaffrey, who they're also married, and Brian is George's brother. Um, they represent a more ordinary, like normal family at the time, um, who like are kind of uh, dysfunctional in a sense. Um, they're a bit grumpy with one another, but at the end of the day, uh, they kind of act as a more grounding force um, compared to other characters such as um, Adam, their son, or Tom McCaffrey, the youngest brother of the two, uh, or even George himself. You have Alex McCaffrey, who is one of the first characters we're introduced to. She is the mother of George and Brian. She's not the mother of Tom, but she acts as kind of a surrogate mother for when Fiona, um, Tom's true mother, uh, has run away. And this, this all happens in the introduction, so I'm not spoiling anything at the minute, don't worry. So Adam McCaffrey is the son of Gabriel and also Brian. Uh, and he is uh, quite a mystical character in the sense that he may, it's never mentioned specifically in the book, perhaps because of the time it was written, but it's clear that he is on the spectrum um, and his dog called Zed. Also, we get a couple of moments in the book uh, from Zed's perspective, the dog, which is really interesting as the dog, um, like in many of other Iris Murdoch's book, is used as kind of uh, symbolism throughout the book, as well as the reoccurrence of uh, foxes and things like that, which appear in gypsy mythology. Um, speaking of which, uh, Alex McCaffrey also has a kind of um, maid or servant who's been with her called Ruby, who also plays quite a, a large part in the book, so she's not to be forgotten. We also have Tom McCaffrey, who's the youngest of the three McCaffrey brothers, um, who is 20. He's coming back from London where he goes to university with his friend Emma, and they get into shenanigans as part of the book as well, which and uh, their characters introduce quite a lot of hilarity in some situations as well. So those are all of the McCaffreys. And then you have John Robert Rosanoff, who is the philosopher that is in the title and also George McCaffrey's uh, teacher. So those are the characters that the plot mainly revolves around, um, the McCaffreys, Rosanoff, uh, etc. And a couple of others are introduced later on that I won't talk about because I'll talk about them in a minute. <laughs> There's a bit of spoiler stuff going on there. But overall, I would recommend this book um, as long as you don't have anything else really lined up that you're really excited to read um, because it will probably take you a while and the ending, in my opinion anyway, is not uh, that good. So if you're reading it, if you're really interested in like having a good ending for a book that you really like a good resolution to, this is not really the kind of book that you might want to put before any other one that you, you're excited to read and it takes a while as well it's quite a hefty book especially if you've got uh, a lot of other stuff going on in your life but if it's like the holidays or uh, if you don't really have much else that you want to read yeah I would recommend uh, giving it a read if not just for the characters themselves who well there's some of the best character development that I've ever seen in any book uh, in this one uh, so I'd recommend reading it just for the characterization. it actually. Okay, so now I'm going to be going through the plot. So there will be spoilers ahead. So skip um, to the, the timestamp that I've put in the description if you want to uh, skip out on all the spoilers and if you're interested in reading this yourself. Okay, okay, are you all gone? All right, now it's just the people left who are interested in hearing about the plot but might not necessarily want to read it yourself. Okay, so basically the story starts out with a lot of world building, like a lot. And even I had to like skim read some of these pages because there's just a lot of exposition that really wasn't that necessary. Um, I suppose it's nice to build a kind of 
worlds around the story but there's a lot of it here so there are two preludes in this book the first one uh is about the accident that uh, Stella and George get into which is the first scene of the entire book and basically um, he's driving they get into an argument because uh, as I said George is a massive dickhead and uh, Stella is kind of she's strong-willed in a way too strong-willed uh, agrees everyone to be uh, George's wife so they get into an argument and he gets riled up as soon as she mentions Rosanoff um, and he ends up crashing the car and then uh, it is left a mystery as to whether uh, he gets out of the car and begins to push Stella and the car into the river, uh, um, like down a little cliff into the river um, as, as an attempt to drown her or whether it accidentally happened. That is left a bit up in the air. We don't really find out till later on. Miraculously, Stella survives and is in the hospital uh, and George ended up walking just back to his own bed and wakes up and is in a bit of a shock. And so after this really extreme sort of tension going on, we then get to the second prelude, which is where all of the world being the building that I was just talking about happened. What happens next is about 16 pages full of text full of world building this is actually insane i've never seen someone so dedicated to like building the area and the town around it before it began and even though it's only 16 pages it feels so long if you're trying to just read through the the, the gaps uh, in the paragraphs are like kind of sparse and that makes it feel even worse I think so don't really worry if you just want to like skim read over the paragraphs in this bit because only a bit of it really ever comes up again in the future um, there are some mentions of like the, the circle the ring basically it's called the ring and it's like a ring of rocks which you can see on the cover here um, uh, and there's a couple mentions of some of the characters as well and what they're all about um, really just chucks information at you and you don't have to really worry about memorizing it because not only can you just go back and check if you think that something was mentioned that you missed but you can also just ignore it because um, things are explained quite often and again and again throughout the book. Then we finally get into the proper plot, which is titled The Events in Our Town, which goes all the way up until what happens afterwards. So this is the, the main plot, main story. A couple more things happen. They introduce the idea that Tom McCaffrey is also coming back to Endstone from London and that he's bringing a friend called Emma. And uh, Brian particularly is quite relieved as it mentions there was some anxiety uh, as to whether Tom was a homosexual or not. Um, which gets revolved in Brian's perspective when uh, it's said that he's bringing a friend called Emma. We first get introduced to Alex McCaffrey, who's the mother, um, who is similar to George in many ways, and they get along quite well throughout the entirety of the book. Um, and she discovers that Rosanov, the philosopher, is coming back to Enninstone. That is the name of the town that they are at, um, which N, the narrator, who's nicknamed himself N and nicknamed the town Enninstone, has decided on. Well, you can definitely tell when this book was written, that's for sure. We also meet Stella, who's recovering in the hospital. Uh, Gabrielle McCaffrey, who's married to Brian McCaffrey, uh, goes to meet her. And uh, Gabrielle likes Stella very much, thinks he's very intelligent. So does Brian, actually. Um, they both think Stella is very intelligent and too good for George, which is the general consensus um, in the throughout the town. Um, the girls are kind of jealous of her. Uh, the men think that she's be, uh, making a stupid decision by being with George. Gabrielle offers to let Stella into her house to stay with Brian for the time being, and uh, that's what happens. Um, after a very brief, very brief visit from George, um, that, that's, that, that's where she goes, basically. We get introduced to Diane, who is basically George's personal prostitute. <laughs> um, it's a strange situation. What happened was... Um, George came along uh, to Diane and offered to pay her rent, pay everything for her, as long as she would only like hang out basically with him uh, and keeps her in like a separate flat, which um, Stella sort of knew about, sort of didn't. Um, but it just kind of adds to the idea in Stella's mind that George needs saving and that she should be the one to save him. I realise now I'm skipping through like a lot of detail, like there's a lot of detail here that is I'm not going to be speaking about because it would probably, this video would probably be as long as it took me to <laughs> read this book um, because there's just an insane amount of detail here, um, especially if you think about it. This was written by, um, the narrator is N, who is a, a, a person living in Enninstone, who has only had the help 
of uh, Stella in writing this and at the end a certain woman. Uh, it is assumed that this certain woman is Iris Murdoch um, but the issue is you're wondering how did he know all this? It's ridiculous. <laughs> So Tom McCaffrey shows up to Ennistone with his friend Emma, who turns out is Emmanuel, Emmanuel Scarlett Taylor, who's one of his mates from university. And, you know, so Brian's fears were not put to rest. And this begins one of the most anticlimactic sort of romance subplots that I've read in quite a while. <laughs> Throughout the rest of the novel, uh, it is pretty much made clear that uh, Tom is either uh, homosexual or bisexual and that Emma is again either homosexual or bisexual um, and they have a lot of moments where you think oh this is it they're gonna get together and I wonder what's gonna happen afterwards uh, and they never do <laughs> and you'll probably see one of the reasons uh, later but it's such a it's a very anticlimactic ending uh, one that you definitely weren't expecting everyone's swimming in the spa the baths at Enninstone and then suddenly Rosanov turns up out of nowhere um, they only had a, a small amount of warning about it and now suddenly he's there. Pretty much straight away Alex receives a little note from Rosanov passed through Ruby um, and Alex is really excited because she always had this kind of small bit of herself that wanted Rosanov to like her instead of her best friend because they used to know each other when they were younger. She wanted him to like her instead of her friend Linda. We then get some stuff from Rosanov's perspective, which was really interesting to me the first time I read it. Um, basically, we find out that he's moving back to Enstone from America. He's kind of uh, at the reaching the end of his career and he's planning to write his big final book, but he's really unmotivated to do it and he's not really seeing the point in all this in philosophy anymore. He's kind of losing his motivation. Um, he has a granddaughter called um, Hattie, who he never really got on with before, but is kind of determined to give her a good life. He is, however, aware that George McCaffrey is still in Enninstone. And I would say personally that Rosanov, in a small way, is kind of, well, maybe not at this point, but certainly very soon becomes afraid of George McCaffrey, like a number of other people in Enninstone. When he was younger, um, a few years prior, George was a... Uh, pupil of philosophy and Rosanov was his teacher and George became so obsessed with him that he would uh, follow him around try asking questions um, and then when he got kicked out of the course basically and told by Rosanov to give up philosophy uh, he did give up philosophy but he still followed him around he tried to follow him to America and eventually came back and it's one of his biggest one of George's biggest life regrets that he gave up philosophy and he blames this on Rosanov but um, still would like kind of like closure uh, in a sense. He wants Rosanov to admit that it was not the best decision to make for him and that he should have gone into philosophy. So he's still trying to get his attention. That's why both Alex and George think that Rosanov is there for them. Alex opens up the note that she was given by Rosanov and it's just a letter asking um, whether it would be okay if he could rent the silver house. Now, because Alex is kind of in love with Rosanov, she says, yes, of course, without even thinking about it, um, open to rent. She even offers to let him stay there for free, but he declines and says, no, I'll pay for it. Alex is really excited. She gets everything set up. And then this is when it all changes because Hattie, who is Rosanov's granddaughter, moves into the house instead of Rosanov. Alex is appalled, but she can't say anything about it because that's not polite. So she just waits. George visits Rosanov um, twice and both times Rosanov attempts to be apathetic towards him in the hope that it will get him to go away because Rosanov recognises that all George wants is some kind of emotional response from him, whether it be anger, whether it be kindness, he just wants something from him but Rosanov refuses to give it to him. However, this doesn't work and it just makes George all the more consumed by his thoughts about Rosanov. Stella goes missing and no one really knows where she is. Gabriel's the only one that's really worried. George thinks that it's probably a good thing that she went missing. He doesn't really want to know where she is and he thinks it probably might be good if actually they never see each other again. There is also a character who's the priest in Enniston who's the only character who witnessed the original um, ac car accident in the prologue. Um, and his name is Father Bernard and uh, his only real purpose in the book is to kind of provide some sort of discussion on religion and philosophy. He talks to Rosanov as there is no other philosopher in Enniston rather than George that uh, is available to talk and Rosanov misses talking with other philosophers about these sort of issues and so he talks to 
uh, Father Bernard about it. Uh, and he has quite a lot to say, some interesting things. Generally, uh, Father Bernard is not as well versed as Rosanov, but they mention a lot of things about um, God and how uh, can you really be considered uh, Christian, for example, if you don't believe in the kind of exact same God that is written about in the Bible or that some Christians believe about. Is it okay to have your own personal version of Christianity, basically? Rosanov also uh, asks Father Bernard to be Hattie's tutor, and this is the beginning of a theme that will occur again throughout the book is that Rosanov has some kind of um some kind of psychic power over the people in Ernesto making them just do what they want because they're curious or because they're flattered or because they feel like they want to be a part of his life this happens again when Tom is called to go and see Rosanov uh, a little bit later in the book um and is asked by Rosanov to marry Hattie yes that's right to marry his granddaughter without ever having met her before he wants her to um, basically marry this boy who he's kind of selected as Rosanov wants to have control over her life even after she becomes an adult he's worried about for example who she's gonna be with who she's gonna lose her virginity to which is a bit concerning but you'll find out why he's concerned about that a bit later on now you'd think tom would just say no he's a happy-go-lucky innocent kind of guy who is really not interested in tying himself down to anyone but rosanov says if you don't accept then you can never ever talk to her or see her ever and tom's kind of curiosity and flattery at the fact that rosanov chose him out of everyone else uh, overwhelms this and even though he's a bit angry is shouting at him he eventually says yeah sure I'll do it he's sworn to secrecy but Tom does not abide by this and tells his best friend Emma and Emma is rightfully shocked and appalled at this when Tom tries to show up to the slipper house uh, where Hattie is staying uh, with some flowers and things it goes pretty horribly and Hattie thinks he's impolite and her um, kind of maid called Pearl thinks that he's just a bit strange. That creates another conflict in the book that is carried on throughout. Um, basically there's kind of tension between Tom and Hattie now. Hattie's only 17 remember at this point and Tom is 20 so it was kind of a strange decision even from the start. Throughout this time we've been getting perspectives from all sorts of people from Alex, uh, from Rosanov, from father bernard from george from we had a bit from stella but after the first original um sort of like first few pages we don't really get much from her until a bit later we've had stuff from gabriel from uh brian from adam from zed uh basically everyone from diane as well she explains how she kind of wants more she loves george as many of the other girls in enna stone do but she doesn't have much power over him she knows that she has to be subservient for him to like her but if she wants the things that she wants from him, which is a romantic relationship to escape her life in Ennerstone then she has to be more powerful but so that creates a bit of a cycle that she can't escape now this is something that is really unexpected that happens bang in the middle of the book after you've got that whole kind of tension between Tom and Hattie uh, established they all go on like a family holiday to the beach and it kind of shocked me at first like what why did they just suddenly go to the beach on a holiday i guess it was mentioned like a couple of you know chapters before but really it just kind of came out of nowhere <laughs> and the strangest part is they invite hattie and pearl why why it was okay so the reason they invited hattie and pearl is because gabrielle wants to go, get on their like good side as they were the new thing in town everyone was like um like finding out about them and also obviously Rosanov's granddaughter she wants to get in his good books as well but still how did they not know <laughs> so the beach holiday is going kind of okay you can tell Gabrielle's a little bit like she's a bit all over the place she's um she's not living a happiest life with Brian who's you can tell that most of the characters in this story one way or another are a bit dislikable except for a select few that I'll go through later um, but so George is very clearly abusive towards Stella uh, and other people as well. He's just an abusive person. He's abusive towards Stella, Tom, Brian, his, basically his whole family. And that's very clear. But Brian is abusive in a more like select way, a kind of emotionally abusive, I suppose. He uh, always puts Gabrielle down no matter what she says. 
uh, kind of thinks everything's a bad idea. He's really like really negative. He's one of those people that just drains the energy out of you. And um, so that may be one of the causes towards Gabrielle's like confusion and uh, upset. Uh, at this point in the book. A really good example of this is when she comes across uh, these two like young teenage boys. I like how they describe them like wear the le wearing leather jackets as if that's like a, a youthful thing back in these times that the, the teenagers just run around wearing leather jackets. I guess nowadays it's puffer jackets um, but it was quite interesting just to read that to get an idea of how much like society has changed and you find that throughout the whole book. So yeah she finds these two guys and they've captured like a fish in like a tiny tiny pond they put it in a tiny pond and she's like oh let it go would you let it go because she's starting to place importance on things that really she would not have done previously in her life because adam her son uh finds very strange things to be worth a lot to him so for example he got very upset that she wouldn't buy a piece of broken china even though it's just broken china because he said it, it like needs a home and needs someone to fix it um, so she started to do the same thing and she gets very upset about it and um, runs crying to Brian who's all like why are you crying you know we should, shouldn't be crying this is ridiculous. Meanwhile George also comes on the holiday if not just because he knows it will annoy everyone else and uh, he kind of spends most of the time separated from everyone um, and just chilling there basically. Meanwhile Emma and Tom also come along and there's some romantic and sexual tension between them um that is maintained but tom's tom does not think about emma as much as emma thinks about tom and that's kind of something that will uh increase more and more as at the beginning it was kind of like uh an equal relationship now it's more of a one-sided thing as tom is starting to feel really guilty about the whole hattie situation he knows he should have just said no from the get-go but he didn't and he's trying to think of ways to resolve it but hattie keeps on like um not forgiving him in a satisfying way so he's been really like uh, overwhelmed with all of that stuff a running thing that uh, happens with tom is that he feels as though he's like lost his innocence uh, and that he's feeling like all sorts of negative emotions for basically the first time as he's kind of losing his youthfulness in a way whereas emma already experienced this as he's struggling with his like national identity because he comes from ireland but does not really identify with the Irish at all. This was obviously written in the time uh, just after like the troubles were going on and so he's having a bit of like an identity crisis in that aspect. He's also not sure whether he wants to like take go on with history and become a historian or continue on with his singing and that's like something that has been plaguing with his mind so there's a real contrast between kind of innocence and a lack thereof. So Brian leaves Adam and Zed alone on the beach and Adam decides to take Zed for a bit of a swim. Uh, and unfortunately, because he swims so far out, Zed gets lost and everyone panics thinking he's he's drowned somewhere and everyone eventually comes to the conclusion after everyone went out to search for him that Zed must have drowned. But then George comes around the side of the cliff uh, with Zed and this is a sign to Gabrielle who's been in love with George for a, quite a while now, like a lot of other girls in Ennistone, um, that he's changing, that he's, he's starting to change. George knows that he's not changing at all um i'm sure that n who's the narrator knows that he's not changing at all but this for a couple of characters gives the idea that he's a he's a changed man that he's changing ruby goes up to look at the marysville house which is basically the old house of alex that she sold and um we found out a few chapters on when they finally leave the beach that Stella was in the house the whole time and she was nervous. She saw George walking past going for a swim. She was staying there with Anne actually. So Stella has been staying with Anne, the narrator, throughout the whole time that she's been missing, which is quite a while. And it's quite a surprise to see her pop up again. You didn't really think she was going to show up until like the end. So they all go back to uh, Ennistone and kind of chill there for a while. Um, Rosanov makes a visit to Hattie and realises how much he's like missed her and that uh, he shouldn't have like dedicated so much of his life to philosophy and left her to fend for herself. Um, it's well known amongst everyone that um, basically Rosanov doesn't like children but this is very swiftly changed the more he visits Hattie. Emma begins to lose hope that Tom is going to like him back because uh, he thinks that he likes Anthea Eastcote, who's uh, one of the village girls, who's a very beautiful village girl, um, who is the daughter of William Eastcote, who's basically, he is the person in Enniston who everyone likes the most. He's who everyone comes to talk to and he's just a lovely guy in general. He'll come up a bit later and he triggers a couple of a series of events. Uh, Tom accidentally leads a 
like a bunch of partying and drunk people to the Sliver house where Hattie's staying and starts a bit of riot by accident. Uh, this again causes tensions between Hattie and Tom to skyrocket and you think, well, it's probably never going to get better at this point and Tom just becomes more and more overwhelmed by grief. George is there also for some reason and he breaks into the Sliver house for some reason. Uh, it's never really made that clear other than the fact that he just wanted to see who Hattie is because she's linked to Rosanoff. Anyway, this party causes like a massive stir up uh, in the like the tabloids. And uh, another thing about uh, England that is explored within this book is kind of like the local tabloids and how much they dramatize everything and make things up. And it's quite ridiculous. Um, but an outsider might think that's actually what happened because um, the there are a few newspapers that talk about the party in it like quite an exaggerated way um it mentions details like um that tom mccaffrey was obviously the one to uh start the party there that either hattie was like quite like a stuck-up princess or that she was like uh helping with the party as well um george mccaffrey was there obviously um that was mentioned in the papers because george the mccaffreys are quite like a uh, talked about topic amongst enninstonians um, another thing that's mentioned is that Pearl, who is obviously Hattie's maid, was um, kissing with another girl, which is bound to cause a scandal back in the 80s. Um, and basically the reason this was written is because uh, Pearl did actually kiss Emma, who was drunk and wearing a girl's wig. <laughs> It talked about how violent it was, that windows were smashed, etc, etc. So Rosanov wouldn't usually have been able to get hold of this, but someone uh, in Enninstone passed him a copy of the newspapers underneath his door and he read them. And obviously he's from America, he doesn't really know much about how Enninstone has changed since he's been gone. He believes all of it, probably unreasonably, um, and goes to confront, confront Hattie about this. And this is basically the end of his heather. He's had enough. Tom has also been around about. He's kind of basically nearly given up on apologising. He's really distraught. Feels like everything has gone down the drain ever since he talked to Rosanoff for the first time. Uh, and at the worst possible moment, Stella also comes back and goes back to her house where George sees her. Immediately they go back to arguing. George has a fit because he thinks, well, Stella's basically incapable of love and keeps telling her this and Stella's just kind of sitting there like, whatever you want to believe, because she still thinks that he, uh, she can save him. He says to Hattie, right, that's it. Um, I'm taking you away. You're going to come live with me. You're going to be away from Pearl. And Pearl is very upset about this. So is Hattie because they've been like sisters ever since that um, she was assigned to Hattie. Both Tom and George and Alex were all planning on going to visit William Eastcote to kind of help get him to help sort out their problems. And Tom actually goes to visit him whilst um, Rosanov is at Hattie's house um, taking her away. But when he gets there, it turns out that William Eastcote just died um, and that Anthea Eastcote is there, tells um, Tom what happened, uh, assuming that he came for that reason. Um, and so Tom now has no one to talk to, he doesn't know what to do. William's death triggers a, a series of events um, because George basically just went to, uh, just found Stella, he thought, right, <laughs> I have to do something. And so uh, that something is what happens a few chapters down the line. Uh, Tom is in a bit of a frenzy. He's been walking around all night, can't get to sleep. He goes to where the, the springs are and ends up getting trapped in quite like a hot area down at the bottom near where the root of the spring is. And so he nearly dies. That's very intense. That was one of the most intense parts because if you couldn't tell by how much I'm biasing this plot review towards him, he's probably one of my favourite characters. So that was a very intense moment. Um, and uh, so basically at this point, Rosanov has taken Hattie away. Pearl is distraught, doesn't know what to do. Uh, and so Rosanov then has something to confess to Hattie. Now, it's ridiculous. This is where it starts getting ridiculous and really just hard to believe, but also like really intriguing. Um, Rosanov confesses to Hattie that he is in love with her. And uh, at first I was like, oh, he just feels really strongly about um, the grand granddaughter, grandfather bond that they have. Like he's been missing out on his whole life and now he's realized how important it is. But that is not the case because Hattie then asks, um, in a grandfather way or in a in love way and he says in an in love way like he says the latter i was 
I was so shocked. <laughs> that is one of the uh, biggest revelations of the book. What something that I think that probably could have been developed more, but I suppose that it's um a relatively a, a relatively well developed uh, progression of emotions throughout the book. Um, it's hard to justify, <laughs> but it's it's a. Uh, it's reasonable in how his emotions progressed it went from like remorse to extreme guilt um then whenever he saw her he he felt as though like he should have done more for her and it eventually develops into this feeling of of love which i would argue is probably not true in any sense um and because hattie is quite vulnerable she's been all over the place people have been coming at her and she just wants to go back to how life was before when it was just her and pearl in america she kind of gets um she kind of gets manipulated by this in the sense that so once they're together he guilts her into staying with her and then when he confesses that uh he is in love with her she kind of ends up saying the same thing and at the end of the book which is not far now um iris murdoch says basically that her first sexual awakening was with rosanov which I still haven't wrapped my head around how that's worked out, but she basically ends up confessing the same thing, even though she never felt that way, like even one hour before their conversation. Rosnov basically says, no, no, it's not gonna happen. This is, well, obviously he doesn't want to be in a relationship with his granddaughter. He just wants to get it off his chest that he's been feeling that way. Um, he says, no, you have to go, look, go back to Pearl. Um, he changed his mind in like 24 hours, which is ridiculous. But when he goes to open the door to try and force Pearl out, Tom is there because he thought, well, um, because the slipper house where uh, Hattie was originally is gone, maybe I can catch them before they leave or else this empty feeling will be left in my chest forever. So he goes to see them and he says, I'm, I'm here for uh, Hattie. And then Rosnov just like chucks her at him, <laughs> um, basically. Uh, and originally I thought that Tom wanted to see her just to apologise and say, be on your way, leave me alone, I'm going back to London to hang out with Emma and that 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 plot line would finish. Um, but in the end, he just takes her back to the other house which has been abandoned because Pearl left, she was very upset she left. Um, and then like asks her to marry him. Where did that come from? Literally a minute ago, they hated each other. And now he wants to marry her. I guess, so it says in the blurb a lot about some kind of magical and mystical things. I guess this is where it comes in it's right at the end. Like they didn't introduce much magical stuff really other than like Rosanov's apparent hypnotism ability, like before it all comes in at the end. And this is one of the things that I thought, I mean, it could be explained some, by some kind of magic, but they really don't, it might be like um, a time period thing that that was kind of more normal back in the day, but I, even then I can't really imagine it. Um, my parents have never read the book and they were kind of like, they were young in the 80s, so they haven't read it, but uh, I would be very surprised if this was something that happened regularly back then. So that was very annoying because it meant that the, the romantic development between Emma and Tom just cut dead um mentioned very briefly like in the what happened afterwards section but other than that completely dead but there is one good part of the ending and i'm about to describe it now so you're thinking the main the main plot point like there are loads of other plot points that are nearly main ones but the main one is the conflict between rosanov and george and basically rosanov sent um george a letter being very aggressive in the sense that that would make him go away because being apathetic hasn't so he's resorted to like being aggressive maybe this will work fingers crossed but it kind of has the opposite effect whilst maybe it would have worked at first then george sees stella and gets very mad he, he had promised Diane to like take her to Spain um, and they could live out the rest of their life. But again, after seeing, seeing Stella, this kind of deteriorated in his mind for whatever reason. Diane is very, very sad about this, uh, as you can imagine. But so that's all kind of ruined. And George just thinks, right, I got to I got to do something. I got to stop this. And so he goes to Rosanov's house and drowns him. Again, the book is unclear as to whether he actually is the one who killed Rosanov because on the desk, Father uh, Bernard finds a note that says, um, I'm going to take poison and kill myself um, because basically after William died, that's what he wants to do. And um, 
he didn't he, Rosnov thought he didn't really have that much to live for anyway he'd kind of finished his um sort of uh, life of philosophy and stuff he couldn't really think of that much to write in his book then he fell in love with his granddaughter so it was kind of over for him so I think it's kind of revealed that um, in the end he did kill himself and that George didn't but the fact that George had the intent anyway and um, but he basically he moved the bed towards a bath that was like boiling and scalding and um, tried to drown Rosanov even though uh, it might have been clear during the chapter, actually, if you'd read it with the context context that comes afterwards, that um, Rosanov was already dead at that point. But when you're reading it, you think that, oh, George has done it. He's killed him. George then wanders down to the ring again, the ring of stones here, which is briefly mentioned during the uh, prologue. Um, and basically, he goes there. He, like, sits down in the middle. He then sees an eclipse. That didn't actually happen but he sees it he then sees a ufo and there were like one or two ufo sightings mentioned at the beginning of the book um since then it hasn't really been mentioned he sees a ufo it like blinds him and then um and then he kind of wakes up father bernard is there because he saw him walk out of rosanov's house and father bernard thought that he killed rosanov which fair enough so he went to look but then found the note so father bernard comes and saves him uh, it's revealed that George didn't kill Rosanov and according to Father Bernard, who is the only um, witness, uh, he also didn't attempt to kill Stella. So he, he, he like thought that he might have tried to push the car, but in actuality it was an accident and that he didn't. But when George wakes up from his little thing, he is blinded. He's blinded for a week. Uh, it's later revealed that he gets over it. And... Um, uh, Father Bernard helps him back, basically. And after that, George becomes not George. He becomes like, like subservient, docile, not angry anymore. I was so mad when I read this part. When I read most of the ending, other than the bit where um, George killed Rosanoff, which turns out didn't even happen anyway. Um, it was just so frustrating because there has been so much character development on George and then it just all goes away. <laughs> it just leaves all of his characterization for nothing because he just turns into a docile version of himself. The ideal version that Stella thought he could get out of him, but it wasn't Stella that did it to him. It was a UFO. It was just a random UFO. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> UFOs? Okay. An interesting thing that happens at the end is that, um, Alex gets annoyed at Ruby for calling the um, pest control on the foxes because she liked the foxes, but Ruby thought that they were um, a bad sign. And in, in gypsy mythology, foxes are a bad omen. So uh, Alex got really mad at her and like started yelling at her. But when she approached Ruby, Ruby pushed her downstairs and because they're quite old, um, it did a lot of damage. And I was really excited about this bit because I thought, Oh my gosh, Ruby is like the silent stoic character throughout the whole thing and she's finally snapped at like her mistress um, and uh, killed her. And that was really exciting ending for that kind of plot line. But then again, it turns out that Alex didn't actually die. <laughs> she just, she lived and again is magically turned docile like George and lives with Ruby for the rest of her life. Um, kind of struggling to do basic tasks again. Kind of a disappointment <laughs> um which i suppose this kind of thing would definitely have been dramatic in the in the kind of like time that this was released a lot of stuff i've read for example war of the worlds before that that book would have been so scary and dramatic for the people reading it in the 20th century but like and the 19th century as well but nowadays because maybe because of the overexposure we've had towards uh, kind of dramatic books and thrillers and and fantasy and and sci-fi it's kind of like gotten a bit you know it's not exciting anymore because we've just seen more exciting things but I have to say that the random appearance of UFOs while it may be dramatic it wasn't satisfying uh, at all and the character development that's been happening so slowly and so uh, so like well throughout the rest of the book just in these last like 50 pages or so just goes away <laughs> and you're left feeling really disappointed because you get a what happened afterwards section and uh 
in it. Basically, Tom marries um, uh, Harriet. And you're thinking, oh, yes, finally, it's going to be like, and it was not a happy marriage because, you know, Tom liked Emma the whole time or or just wasn't interested in Hattie because it was clear that he wasn't interested in her throughout the whole rest of the book and then suddenly was. Um, you thought, oh, it's going to end in an unhappy marriage, but no, they get married and they're both happy and that's just the way it is. Um, you think Emma and Pearl are probably going to get together, but they don't. They decide that they don't like each other anyway. <laughs> then Alex and uh, Ruby again stay for the rest of their life. Um, Stella looks after George and um, Diane goes off to uh, live with a little bit for Father Bernard um, uh, abroad, but then Father Bernard leaves her and goes on a little bit of a pilgrimage himself. And so all in the end, that's basically how it ends. There's, there's no thing afterwards. That's just how it is. And then um, M doesn't play that big of a role. He plays a bit of a role throughout the book, but he's mainly just the narrator. Um, Stella plays a bigger role, definitely, in helping that sort of aspect. But yeah, that's how it ends. Now, of course, I missed out on a lot of detail just then, but I don't want to make this uh, recording too long. I just want it to be fairly brief and all the people who don't want the spoilers, um, welcome back. Uh, just gone through the plot and uh, the ending as well, which I said before was not personally an ending that I particularly enjoyed. <laughs> but uh, I suppose it tied up all the ends, but not in a satisfactory way. So yeah, as I said before, there's quite a lot of uh, philosophical talk, but not so much that an ordinary reader would be put off by it. Uh, it's really useful to anyone who's like thinking of studying philosophy or, or studying like English as well, to see how well characters can be developed uh, or to like get a better understanding of like religious philosophy. Um, there's quite a lot of interesting debates and discussions within this book, but really if you're interested in philosophy, I'd recommend probably reading her non-fiction books, which include uh, Metaphysics as a Guide to Morals and Existentialists and Mystics. I personally never read them, but from their reviews and so on and so forth, they look quite good. So yeah, I feel like I should probably do uh, a rating now. So overall, my rating of this book, and I'm going to do it out of 10 because I think it's a more precise scale, is 7. <laughs> I'm going to give this book a 7 out of 10 because uh, it's quite lengthy. It keeps your interest, but not so much that you feel like you can't put it down. It took me uh, a couple of weeks and a bit to read it. Um, so overall it wasn't that gripping. However, uh, it makes up for it in character, characterization and development and world building. All, all of those things I really value in a book. World building is one of my favorite things uh, about good books. If you have good world or universe building, then it just makes the rest of the book so much better. And while this section was a bit tedious at the beginning, uh, it's also incorporated throughout the rest of the novel. So that's a plus as well. The characters are just perfect you have so many good characters it's really easy to get invested in each individual character because they go into so much detail when you're reading from each individual character's perspective one after the other you get a really really broad like review of 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 how each character feels uh what they're thinking it's really fantastic the plot is okay the plot is good um not the most interesting concept but um i think a lot of it more is about the discussions that it creates rather than the plot itself. Um, it's also quite comedic. There are a lot of very funny moments in there. And I know that the the original review by the New York Times when this book came out was that it's primarily comedic, but I feel like a lot of the jokes nowadays will go over our heads because it's just not written for a modern audience. Um, it, obviously it was back then, but not anymore. We're gonna miss out on quite a few of the jokes, but there are certain times when it is quite comedic. Um, However, I also took off uh, a few points because of the ending. It's really disappointing in my opinion. Uh, some people might like it, some people might like endings like that, but honestly, just not for me. <laughs> no, thank you. I was expecting a little bit more magic, but also I'm glad that it stayed relatively realistic up until the end. Um, and that it kind of, that was maintained throughout the plot. Yeah, that's why I would give this book a 7 out of 10. It's quite a long read, so put aside some time for it if you're not a super fast reader. I know some people who would get through this in like a week, and honestly, I envy you if you think you can read that fast. <laughs> I really envy you. But um, yeah, so you might want to put aside a bit of time, 
and again like I said at the beginning if you have any other books that you think you would probably rather read I would recommend reading them first because while this is good it's not that good and obviously this video is from a perspective of someone who is not really an academic I <laughs> just I just like reading um I'm not really a philosopher although I'm interested in the subject um I'm also not like a writer or a critic or anything I'm just a, a normal girl so uh, this is from like a ordinary perspective as well so uh, I think people who are interested in philosophy would be more into it people who are less interested in arts and humanities will probably not be as interested in it it's got quite a lot of that kind of talk um, and if you quite like plots to be like forward and logical and stuff happens like in a linear way again might not be quite for you because it, the plot tends to go like all over the place and you have like three or four different plot lines going on at once and they one gets resolved and another one starts and so on and so forth so yeah thank you for uh watching my book review on the philosophy apparently you can buy it for about 10 pounds which is not too bad um in canada sorry about this any canadians it's 20 dollars. <laughs> sorry about that um i'm not sure about the conversion rates to us if you're or if you're living anywhere else, I'm not sure. But it says you can probably buy it for about £10. But I just borrowed this from the library. Um, I can tell it's not that well known because they only just recently got it in. I'm not sure if it was even on request or not. If it was on request, then uh, I'm sorry to whoever I stole this for like four weeks from. <laughs> so while this wasn't my favourite book, uh, I didn't see many reviews of it out there. And I thought that it was not definitely notable enough um, to have at least a little bit of a following. So I decided to make this review. Let me know if you enjoyed it. Let me know if you would like me to review any other books because I do have some favourites that I might review as well at some point. Uh, this is my first ever video, so if you like it, let me know. Thank you. Peace out. <laughs>